Hey, welcome everyone to the Sinai Got Smart webinar on tibial plateau fractures. We're going to give everybody some time to join. So as we're waiting for everyone to join the meeting, we're going to launch a, a little poll about where you're calling in from. Let's go ahead and launch the uh, share the poll results. Looks like we have uh, people calling in from around the world, uh, mostly from Africa, but really uh, everywhere is represented. So thanks, everyone. Uh, we're going to begin with uh, uh, an introduction from Dr. Lou Zirkel from SIGN. Thank you for joining the webinar on tibial plateau fractures. They are very important for us to learn how to treat because if not stabilized properly, they lead to a great deal of disability. SIGN has developed a plate which you can use to stabilize this, and this is a relatively new development and use for the plate. I hope you will send your ideas about this. We're grateful to Dr. Rishi Vista from Nepal, Dr. Billy Hwanga from Tanzania, Dr. David Shear and Sam Warshep from UCSF, and finally, Dr. Rick Coughlin from UCSF. So thank you to all of you for attending and thank you to all of the panelists. Thank you, Dr. Zirkel, for the, uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, we're really excited that you all joined us today. Uh, we're trying out a new format today uh, of uh, basically focusing this webinar on live case discussion. So the whole webinar will be live. Uh, we have case examples, uh, and we'll be doing some live uh, Q&A as well. Uh, we did do create some didactic lectures and surgical approach videos that hopefully you're able to view uh, prior to the webinar through the uh, I Got Portal YouTube page. Um, if you weren't able to view those, they'll be available after the webinar as well. We're also going to be recording uh, this webinar and making it available along with all the other pre-course materials. Um, and that'll be available both on the IGOT portal as well as the sign hub. And the last thing I just wanted to mention is you have both a chat function and a Q&A function for your questions about uh, specific questions about the cases that are being discussed. Um, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and we'll try to address as many of those questions uh, as we can throughout the webinar. Uh, the first case is going to be by uh, Dr. Rishi Bisht uh, from Kathmandu, Nepal. Thank you, Igar and Sain, for having me in the panel, and welcome all the delegates. Uh, so without further ado, uh, let's start with the first case. Next, please. So this is a 30 years old gentleman. He's a male construction worker. He met with a road traffic accident. He was riding a motorbike. So apparently he was rushing for his work and then his motorbike was hit by a lorry. Uh, there was pain swelling around his left knee. He was rushed to a nearby hospital where primary treatment was done. And after the primary treatment, he was referred to a higher medical center, which was our National Trauma Center. So the good thing is the patient presented to us within 24 hours of the injury, which is pretty rare in this part of the world. Next slide, please. So an examination, the vitals were stable. Uh, there was a verb knee posterior slab, which was in situ. We took it off for further examination. There was a puncture wound less than one centimeter over the left tibial tuberosity, as we can see in the picture on the right side. And there was uh, abrasion surrounding it. There was grade two effusion of the knee joint. The motor and sensory was intact. However, there were asymmetric pulses the dorsal speedies were not palpable on both the limbs. A range of motion was not attempted because of the pain. So as of now, our prime concern was the vascular status. Can we launch the first poll? All right, now, as we launch that one, can I just bring in the panel? Um, what are your thoughts regarding this case with the information till now? Um, I think that, uh... You know, anytime you have a, a higher energy injury like this with an open wound, um, we haven't seen x-rays yet, but we're, we're concerned this is an open fracture and want to make sure that the patient's getting uh, antibiotics um, as soon as possible. So dealing with that open fracture first with, with prophylactic antibiotics, obviously the limb's swollen, we want to be assessing compartments, uh, but 
you know, I would agree that the most pressing concern so far on the physical exam is the asymmetry of the, uh, of the pedal pulses. Uh, I thought that limb should be sprinted as well, because as you are struggling with uh, waiting for x-ray, there could be some movement, so you want to sprint that limb. Yeah, I think that's a great point that the first treatment for a concern about vascular issues is just to, you know, realign the limb and uh, apply a good splint. A lot of times the vasospasm just resolves with mobilization of the limb. Um, Saw any comments to add? Yeah, I mean, I'd echo a lot of the concerns that are already expressed, the compartment uh, issue, the, the vascular examination, um, certainly concerning. Um, I think once we get the results of the poll in, we can dive into exactly, you know, how we might work that up a little bit further. Um, I would agree uh, with splinting. And, you know, we usually, you know, at least have a, have a, uh, a quick lavage at bedside of most open fractures like this, you know, um, uh, removing any gross contamination, not, not any sort of exploration of the wound, but making sure that anything that's grossly potentially contaminating the open wound be removed, um, uh, cleaned, uh, at least superficially and splinted. Great. Yeah. So we're, we're sharing the poll results now, and you can see really a pretty wide distribution of how people would, um, further evaluate that vascular status. Um, you know, I'm curious, Rishi, what your thoughts are on, on, at your center, what the protocol is for a situation like this? Uh, well, it's it's interesting uh, that um, you know there's there's a pretty much a, uh, it's an, a close competition between the ankle brachial plexus index, uh, br uh, br ankle brachial index, and the CT angiogram. Yes, uh, palpating pulses in these kind of situation is not always accurate. There's soft tissue issues, and then there is the uh, spasm issues of the uh, vessel, so it's not really an ideal way. Doppler exam is another fantastic exam that can be done bedside. Uh, but again, it's got its limitations. If, if the patient has a slab, if, if there is soft tissue concerns, then you know, the results are not um, great. And CT angiogram is by far the gold standard, uh, but we've got something different. I mean, we've got something very easy, which can be done at the bedside, which is cheap and which has got a pretty good uh, negative predictive value, um, 95 to 100%. That's ankle brachial plexus index, um, ankle brachial uh, index. And uh, this is what we usually do at our center. Uh, this is because cheap um, and uh, this can be done at the bedside. Uh, regarding the uh, open injuries, well, it's a Gustav Anderson one injury. Um, then um, the first thing is to debris it uh, and re-debrid it since it was referred to us from another center, but we are not too sure with the debridement. We debrid it one. This one, a thorough lavage was given. First generation cephalosporins were given. Uh, I'm sure like there's a much debate about the first generation and the second generation, but that's how we proceeded. We debrided it. We uh, measured the ankle brickle index, which was 0 0.9. And that should be the cutoff point. If anything is less than 0 0.9, now that's the point where you should be uh, thinking about, should we go for a CT angiogram or not? Uh, but luckily, in this case, it was 0 0.9, so we didn't uh, go for a CT angiogram. And within two, two to three hours, the pulses were symmetric again. And uh, there's another thing which I wanted to highlight. Uh, we found the pulses to be symmetric after we took off all the bandages. After we did, um, after we uh, uh, we took off the slab, and then we you know simply put the patient into a uh, crama wire splint. Uh, this point is important because if you are suspecting any vascular issues or compartment syndrome, simply by removing the bandaging, it relieves the pressure as much as 50 to 75%. Um, so that's another important point. If you're suspecting of any uh, compartment syndrome of anything, what you do is the first step is uh, simply take off all the bandages. Um, yes, now can we go to another slide, please? All right, so that's the x-ray now can i bring the panel again uh, what are your thoughts regarding the x-ray yeah it looks to be um, a medial condyle split which uh, with this plain x-ray is difficult to say you know if you are seeing any depression there but uh, i think maybe if the the lateral view shows also that this that is clear uh, postromedial fragments 
So the only issue here maybe you might need to investigate more to see if there's any small fragment and uh, which could be depressed. But frankly speaking, looking at this X, it looks like there's no depression of the major fragment. That's great. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think we can see this, obviously this, there's this large uh, fragment. These are, um, I think the other maybe, you know, subtle thing that's worth bringing up is that, you know, because the MCL attachments are so dense, dense on the medial tibial plateau that the, you know, we always say the femur follows the medial plateau. And so what you see here is there's, there's actually some subluxation happening of the, of the femoral condyle and the lateral plateau. So these are the, you know, this one's not maybe not quite at this point a fracture dislocation maybe it was worse at the time of injury but it's certainly a fracture subluxation and so just again to you know these are very high risk for vascular injury compartment syndrome um, and all of those types of issues we know this is an open fracture and i think it's a good point about the depressions typically when the depressions occur in these it's usually sort of a, a skid zone somewhere you know on the lateral plateau as this femur is going by it, it will take take you know, potentially impact the, the plateau on the way. But that's something that's really, I think, sometimes you can catch that on the on the plane x-rays, but it's much easier to evaluate, I think, on the um, on the uh, more advanced imaging. That's, that's good. I, I, I mean, I, I want to reemphasize that these are fracture dislocation or at least subluxation variants, and that's why they're so commonly associated with uh, with vascular injury. The pattern here, I think a lot of the older textbooks would suggest that a Schatzker IV was uh, 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 solely involving the medial, uh, medial tibial condyle, and that's very much not the case. You're going to see a couple of examples of this kind of injury here this morning, and they almost always go through the, through the tibial eminence or even further lateral, um, and you can already see part of that articular surface kind of sloping down as, as uh, as uh, Dr. Shearer was noting. So really important. I think one more thing that I would note uh, here that is a worrisome finding to me is looking at the soft tissues. We often wait until a CT scan or some other imaging study to try to appreciate what's happening in the soft tissues. But you can see the amount of air in the soft tissues here for me is a worrisome sign um, of, a, of a much higher energy injury than just a, a, a simple, we think, oh, Schatzker one, or sorry, Gustavo Anderson one, no big deal, but clearly there's widespread um, air, uh, in, you know, all around the, the leg, and that would make me worry about a subcutaneous degloving, if not, uh, if not worse. So, it raises my red flag about soft tissue concerns, and we'll get into that a little bit more in some of the other cases as well. So you mentioned about the CT scan, right? What about other views? Uh, would you would you want to go for oblique views or stress views? Yeah, I mean, for, I, yeah, I'd be curious to see, you know, maybe some of the participants here who don't have um, re ready access to CT. Um, I, I think uh, an oblique view can be done. When I was a trainee, we used to routinely get oblique views of, uh, for proximal tibial fractures. I think uh, the, the widespread availability of CT scan has kind of obviated the need for that. So we, you know, we tend not to do that anymore. I don't know, Billy, do you guys, are you guys routinely using oblique images? Yeah, we still use more of the plain x-ray. So we get an AP lateral and an oblique view. Rarely we use CT scan because of the expense, cost of paying. I think certainly the oblique views, if, you, if you're not sure, um, if the, there's a tibial plateau fracture, you suspect something, but you're not sure, certainly probably adds some sensitivity to just uh, diagnosing the fracture. I think in this case, um, it's a little bit more clear what's going on. So it's probably not, not as additive, but, but we're also very biased by the fact that for us, uh, getting a CT scan is uh, not, not so difficult. So it's gonna, I think, be very dependent on what's available. Uh, can I answer a couple of questions? You, there's some great questions coming in um, on the Q&A function, so keep those coming. Um, so uh, uh, there's a question about whether there's a, an ACL avulsion or not in the lateral view. And it, it, uh, I think that's a great pickup. It does look like there's, a, there's an avulsion fragment of the eminence. And these are commonly associated. As I said, this is a dislocation or subluxation variant. So very frequently involves a combination of 
uh, of anterior or posterior cruciate ligament disruption. Um, you know, we can maybe hold on the discussion about how to uh, address those at this point, but a great, you know, a great pickup and certainly something you're going to want to watch. Um, uh, question about Doppler in this case, I think we addressed that, but, uh, you know, Doppler um, may, it, you know, you, you could use a Doppler, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, as you're doing an ankle brachial index, but because it tends to not be maybe as quantitative, you know, even if you're Dopplering a pulse, the, the, the relative value is what's of, of, of most use here in comparing it to an uninjured limb like the, you know, the upper extremity break-in. Um, so great, great questions. Keep them coming. Yeah, just to add to the, you know, why can't we do Doppler? The Doppler can be, in, you can feel a Doppler signal, but you can still have a vascular injury issue. So by taking the ratio of where that cuts off and you put a blood pressure cuff, cuff on, to the to the arm, then you can you're much more sensitive at detecting uh, some of the less severe vascular injuries. The obvious vascular injury that's completely pulseless, the doctor will catch, but some of the the more minor ones, I think that's important. Um, in terms, there was a question about pain with the ankle break in, uh, brachial index as well. Like, how do you practically speaking, how do you put a cuff on the leg and not hurt the patient? Uh, look, in tibial plateau fractures, usually it's not too bad to have the cuff lower down below the fracture and be able to still do the, uh, do the examination. I think it's a little bit more difficult uh, in some injuries, um, but it's still, uh, I think, the best screening test. Um, and in, in fact, has been shown to be superior to a CT angiogram just in terms of as a screening test. And it's something that you can do serially, which um, that's why it's kind of the mainstay of treatment. Um, mainstay diagnostic tool. Yeah. Um, question about I I don't know Rishi if you're if you're ready to get into more uh, advanced imaging. Um, there's uh, there's a question that came in about the use of MRI for fractures like this. I'll pose that to you um, and and Billy maybe get a sense of whether you guys use MRI a, as a as a uh, as a part of the di diagnostic workup. Well, in my part, we don't usually routinely do the MRI. Uh, well, what we do is uh, we try to uh, look for the ligamentous laxity or any injuries um, during uh, the I mean, when the patient is anesthetized right before the operation. So intraoperatively, we try to assess the ligamentous function. But routinely, no, we don't get an MRI done routinely. Billy, what do you do? My pleasure. Yeah, in terms of an MRI will be done only maybe uh, a month after, if you are suspecting that there is meniscus or crucial ligament injury, that's when the MRI will be done. But in acute stage, no. I think just another logistical point, even if you have an MRI available, most of these patients acutely cannot tolerate being in an MRI um, with their knee in a fixed position for that long. I, I, I can tell you from personal experience, because I did a research study many years ago, where I was trying to get MRIs on these on these patients with acute tibial plateau fractures, and they just were of almost of non-useful diagnostic quality. So it's a challenge. Yeah, I think another comment on that is just that um, I mean, a lot of these when it's predominantly a bony injury like this, these medial tibial plateau fractures, although they do often have ligamentous injury associated with them, typically fixing the fracture will restore sufficient stability. And the issues tend to be more around stiffness than instability. So um, it's, it's unusual that these patients have long-term instability problems. I think there are exceptions when you get into more of the peripheral rim fractures. So you, you'll see some fractures where just maybe the rim of the plateau and it's more of a dislocation that just has like a small fragment. Uh, those ones, I think you have to worry a little bit more about, you know, ligamentous stability because the bony stabilization alone may not address it, but, um, but generally speaking, um, MRI is not really part of the algorithm for the vast majority of these patients. There's another question that I think is a good segue, which is that um, if we're going to do an X-fix now, should we do the CT scan before or after the external fixator? Um, and we can talk about a little bit what happens with this patient, but um, I would... I don't know what, Rishi, what's here? If you're gonna do an X-Fix, do you typically get the CT scan before or after the X-Fix? Uh, well, I do it before. Typically before. Yeah, I think it, um, 
depends a little bit. If, if you're not sure if you're going to fix it acutely or X fix, then having a CT scan in advance can sometimes help with that decision making. But if you're definitely going to stage it and do an X fix first with delayed definitive fixation, then it probably makes sense to just do the X fix and then get the CT scan because sometimes there's so much displacement that it's hard to see kind of where the you know where all the pieces are. You get a little bit better quality CT scan if you do it after X fix. But um, again, that's only if you're 100% sure you're going to stage it. And so we can talk about what happened with this patient uh, in that uh, regard. Right. Um, so can we can you move on to the next slide, please? So yeah, so we talked about the x-rays. We talked about some oblique views, which we don't do routinely. Uh, stress views, well, again, we don't do it routinely. MRI, we've already talked about the MRI. CT scan. Um, yeah, but just, just a quick word about uh, classification before we go to a CT scan. I'm sure like most of us classify it according to SASCAR classification, right? I mean, there's a couple of classification system, but the two most common are SASCAR and uh, AO OTA. So by this stage, we all agree that this is SASCAR type 4, the medial uh, tibial plateau fracture. Can we go to the next slide, please? So there we have it. Uh, uh, Sam, what do you think about the CD scan? Yeah, this is uh, this kind of confirms uh, a lot of the things that I was concerned about, both kind of on, a, on the bony and soft tissue um, uh, standpoint. So you've got uh, a, a a fracture, a large medial condylar fragment. Um, you've got an extensive zone of impaction that you can see starting at the lateral tibial eminence and extending over as Dr. Shear is pointing out with the uh, with the drawing. Uh, so that's, you know, that's going to be a concern for me because I don't I can't see that um, from a medial, uh, you know, any of the medial approaches. So I'm going to think about how to how to address that. Um, I, I, I can see that the apex of the fracture is, is coming around um, over to the medial side. It's something that, you know, will help guide my, uh, my surgical approach. Um, and, uh, and certainly the, there are avulsions, as one of the participants uh, noted, of, of cruciate ligaments present as well. And then again, I can see this extensive zone of... Uh, of, 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 of sub, subcutaneous emphysema. Um, and this is concerning to me and tells me something of, about just the respect I'm gonna have for this soft tissue envelope and the potential risk for complications um, with really extensive additional surgery at this time. Right, so till this stage, we, uh, we know that uh, there is, um, it, it's a, a Shasker type four. Um, the soft tissue is okay, but then again, there is concerns about the soft tissue. Uh, well, Gosto Anderson one, it's been properly debrided. Um, so what do you wanna do? You wanna go for conservative treatment or operative? You wanna go for operative treatment, like what surgical approach? Before we- Before we, um, before we launch the poll, I just wanted to, um, cause we have a poll that's about sort of the definitive surgical treatment. I think it's worth just talking a little bit about staging or going right for the definitive treatment. Um, Billy, do you have any thoughts on whether you would do, you know, how you would approach this in terms of stage treatment or? Yeah, for sure. Uh, at our institute nowadays, we want all these fractures spanned before going for definitive treatment. We don't have, what is open, it will be debrided, but we, we are scared going for a definitive fixation of this type of injury. So they will get X fix after debridement and then come later on do a definitive treatment. Yeah. Um, Sam, any comments on staging? Yeah, I I will tell you that uh, for me this this is uh, this is this patient's going to get uh, this patient's going to get an early debridement and is going to be spanned. Um, I've already expressed to you some of the concern I have about the soft tissues. Um, and, you know, I think that there's a lot of nuance. I don't span every uh, length unstable tibial plateau fracture variant, and I would consider Schatzker 4s and, and anything beyond that length unstable. So there's always the question of with this benefit potentially from an X-fix, they don't all get spanned, but this one I'm, I'm concerned enough. And obviously I'm not with the patient like you are, uh, 
uh, Rishi. So I don't, you know, there, there may be good reasons why I would, you know, I would not worry as much, but from what I've seen here, uh, my, my answer would be uh, to wash it, span it, and, uh, and observe the soft tissues and wait until they're amenable to, to uh, you know, definitive internal fixation with ORIF. Yeah, I mean, I think the dogma has definitely become that for the Shasker four to six, the first, you know, it's stage treatment with XFIX and then delayed ORIF. Um, although I do think that the pendulum is swinging back a little bit to where there are now, you know, patients who maybe don't have as much swelling, a little bit lower energy Schatzker force, you know, four to six that, um, you know, you can spare the patient the, the, the cost and misery of, of going through stage treatment. Um, certainly the, the open fracture and the gas and the top tissues on this one, uh, you know, adds a layer of, of concern to doing that. But um, yeah, Rishi, what were your thoughts? You were the one actually seeing the patient. Absolutely, I agree to it. I mean, soft tissues should be of your prime concern. It's not uh, just the fracture which you are treating, it's the soft tissue envelope which you are treating. And it's uh, tibial plateau fracture as well. You know, it's, I mean, they can be really troubling if, if you have a problem with your soft tissue envelope. In this case, uh, we were pretty confident with the soft tissue envelope, which we, um, uh, which the patient had. Uh, but somehow, again, you know, it was not a very acute uh, treatment which we did. We waited for about seventy-two hours, and uh, after seventy-two hours, um, we evaluated the skin, the soft tissue conditions, and uh, then went for the uh, definitive treatment. Okay, so. What would you so we're saying, so in your situation, you decided to not to do the um, X fix and go right for definitive treatment. And now we're talking about what would you do? What would be your approach to that definitive treatment? Billy, what are your thoughts on in terms of, you know, surgical approach? Yeah, after visualizing the CT scan, I'm concerned about this postal medial fragment, but I'm seeing that I'm not sure about the split, which is with the lateral fragment, and the depression is also concerned. So uh, I'll use a postal medial approach to go and fix this postal medial fragment. But I want to have some anterior medial, anterior lateral incision and address this lateral fragment plus elevation of the fragment. So the only possibility which I have to elevate this fragment is to make a window anterior and push these fragments with whatever instrument to elevate those. I think so I will have do incision here for fixing the postal medial fragment plus a lateral incision to elevate the fragment and at least to stabilize the lateral fragment. That's my thought. Uh, Sam, any comments on that? Um, yeah, I mean, for the for me, this is a, this is a, a posterior medial and an anterolateral approach. Um, and the, I, I start with the posterior medial. I think you'll get an excellent cortical read um, in this particular fracture and a, be able to apply your plate in buttress mode. But that that impaction is 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 dramatic enough for me to be concerned not just about raising up that articular surface and making it congruent on the lateral side. But I do think a lot of these are also associated with meniscal injury. And uh, it's something that you can see directly and repair straight away. And we know that repair of these large uh, peripheral lateral meniscal tears is absolutely, you know, absolutely important um, for the longevity of the knee. So um, for those reasons, both articular reduction and addressing soft tissue concerns, I'll, this patient gets a lateral approach as well. And, it, you know, I'll often add a small rim plate. Um, I had an example of that in my talk that you can, you can place to just raft up that articular surface after it's been disimpacted. That's great. Yeah, I think uh, there is a little bit of a nuance, the anterior medial versus posterior medial uh, approach. I mean, it's kind of a spectrum really in how you do your incision on the medial side where you can um, I sort of look at the fracture apex and where the fracture line crosses the plateau. This, this fracture apex is a little bit um, on the more the anteromedial surface. So it's not the true sort of classic uh, posterior medial coronal plane. Uh, can we please uh, share the results of the poll? Yeah, so most people chose the posterior medial approach. 
Um, but there was a pretty even, even spread. A few people went for a conservative treatment, um, but. Yeah, I think that, you know, this is a good, good question because you see the, the, the broad distribution of the results. But what I was going to say is that, you know, where you want to put the plate uh, is dependent to me a lot on where this apex is. And then how much of the uh, where you want the, pl the plate to sit, if you want it to sit more on the intramedial surface of the tibia or more on the posterior medial surface. This one is a little bit more of the entire medial plateau with a little bit more of a medial apex. So I think I probably would go a little bit more intermedial with it than the typical one. But um, uh, that's a kind of a subtle nuance, I think. So I don't think either of those answers are wrong. And the lateral approach is really just a question of whether you want to uh, chase after that depression. It certainly looks bad on the coronal. It's not a huge area though, if you look on the axial. So I think it's a little bit um, dealer's choice, how hard you want to go after. That. Can I ask one more, just now that we're down in this rabbit hole of anteromedial, posteromedial, um, you know, there's, there's where that apex resides, which is very medial here. But a lot of that condyle actually is, if you look at the CT scan, there's, you know, a, there, there's a lot of that sitting posterior. So, you know, you want your plate to obviously sit at the apex, but you're also thinking about where the rest of the plate proximally is going to be best positioned to yeah. support that fragment. Um, so anyway, uh, great, you know, great discussion. A um, couple of other questions that have come in, so many good ones. I'll try to answer them and, 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 and bring the good ones to bear here. Some, some have asked, you know, how about, you know, how about doing some kind of minimal fixation? You know, if you're going to span it, you know, is there a role for pinning, you know, putting pins in or trying to stabilize anything in addition? Uh, you know, Rishi, what do you think about that? If you're going to span this, are you, you know, are you thinking about doing any sort of provisional um, uh, fixation or small lag screws or anything like that? Well, if I'm fixing it, definitely, then I'll put a lag screw or something, but provisionally, no, because my, my goal would be uh, to mobilize the patient as soon as possible. Um, so no, I, I wouldn't. I, I would just use them while if I was to fix them, definitely. Great. Yeah, I mean, th the only time that I found myself doing that is, you know, in cases where there might be an extensor mechanism avulsion of the tibial tuberosity that's kicked up so much that it's threatening skin, right? Um, you know, you've all seen these ones where the tibial tubercle just gets yanked up dramatically and it's, you know, that can be a real skin issue. So that's the only time I'm adding any, any real provisional fixation at the time of. Great. Let's... Um... Let's see what you did, uh, Rishi, and then yeah, just, just have a quick bit. This for the sake of time, it's such a great case, great discussion. Yeah, right. Um, and just uh, before we move on to the next one, just a few words about the conservative treatment. I, I saw that some of uh, some of the participants they answered conservative as well, but I think this is one of the very few uh, instances in tibial plateau fractures uh, that needs to be addressed um, operatively. Uh, because even if it is minimally displaced, well, medial plateau fractures, they are bound to displace. So these are one of very few conditions where you would want to focus more on the operative rather than the conservative treatment. Having said that, can we move on to the next one, please? All right, so, um, so we went for our posterior medial incision. Uh, but uh, to be honest, like we marked it posterior immediately, but when we actually gave the incision, uh, we went slightly anteriorly, more of a like anti, um, anterior medial one. Now, that's the provisional uh, reduction which we did with tenaculum. Well, you could use any of the devices to uh, reduce them provisionally and fix them provisionally with K wires. Uh, the next one, please. So there are the intraoperative fluoro uh, fluoroscopic images. Uh, as you can see, we went for the uh, posterior remedial incision and uh, reduced them with tenaculum, fixed them provisionally with K wires. Uh, the next one, please. And we decided to fix the fracture further with uh, the lag screws, as I was saying uh, earlier. Um, so there we go. Uh, cannulated cancellous screws. They, and we didn't uh, chase further after the depression because it looked uh, okay uh, in the oblique views intraoperatively. 
uh, though I agree that you can't really uh, exactly assess the depression without um, actually opening the lateral side. Uh, so there, there's the buttress plate. The next one, please. Uh, some more intraoperative images. Uh, the next one, please. And that's the final image which we have. So two lax screws, a buttress plate on the lateral side. We didn't really change that depression. Uh, and we were very confident with that tibial tuberosity because intraoperatively it was stable. It was not coming off. So we didn't fix that tibial tuberosity fracture. What are your thoughts on this? Um, well, I would say, you know, um, did a great job. I mean, I think the number one thing we harp on with, you know, with these medial plateau fractures or plateau fractures in general is restoration of alignment. And I think if you look at your alignment here, it's, uh, it's really, you know, very good. If you were to try to, I'm not doing a very good job, but try to draw some lines there of trying to measure your, your axis, which should be about three degrees of varus. And I think that's, that looks pretty spot on, uh, to me. Um, you know, it's interesting. I would, I don't even, it's hard to see that lateral depression. Maybe it's, maybe it's still there, like right in there a little bit, but uh, certainly there's a lot of intact lateral plateau. And if you remember that subluxation that was there before, you see that that's gone, which indicates that you've sufficiently compressed it to get that, you know, femoral condyle articulating more appropriately uh, with the intact part of the tibia. So, I mean, I think that all looks looks really good. You know, buttress plating is is definitely the gold standard. I like the lag screws. Um, I, I, there's definitely a part of me that's wondering what's going on with this tibial tubercle over here, if there's something going on with that. But um, was that any concerns about that intraoperatively or? Uh, no, I, I didn't have any concerns intraoperatively. Okay. I was actually planning to fix them with a the lag screw as well, but uh, since intraoperatively, it was pretty stable. I mean, there were no actually, I mean, it looks bad in the x-rays, but uh, intraoperatively, it was pretty stable. So we didn't fix that. Yes, that's great. I, you know, I'd like to um, echo the importance of, of limb alignment. Really, that's probably more important than a millimeter or two of articular displacement. And there was a great question that came up uh, in the in the Q and A before the course about how to how to assess this if you don't have the ability to check alignment as I mentioned in my talk it, intraoperatively particularly with these more unstable uh, you know Schatzker fours fives and sixes I think there are you know a number of ways to do that you know one of them is if you've got any ability to even get a smaller plate do what Dr. Shear just demonstrated, which was measure your anatomic medial proximal tibial angle and see if you're at about three degrees. Um, uh, you can drop a, uh, a radio opaque like bovi cord if you have cautery during the case and you're able to get a couple of smaller uh, field of view images at the hip, knee and ankle, you can draw that plumb line down and make sure that your coronal uh, alignment is appropriate. I don't know if any of you have other uh, tricks for, for checking this intraoperatively when you don't have the ability to get long cassette flat plate images during surgery. Billy, any comments on, on assessing alignment intraoperatively if you can't get an intraoperative plane x-ray? No, no comment. I think someone said everything. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, there's always the poor man's look at the alignment, you know, clinically of the other side and make sure that the clinic, clinically the alignment is appropriate, you know, use your eyeballs. Um, you know, obviously tucking in that posterior, you know, getting that posterior medial apex, that cortical reduction anatomic, hopefully is going to get things in the ballpark. I think when it gets really difficult is when that apex is comminuted and you don't really have a good read. Um, that's when you really have to rely heavily on some of these other techniques. Uh, to try to assess alignment and make sure you've not either under elevated or over elevated that uh, medial plateau. But yes, yeah, great, great questions. Well, I, we have a ton of Q&A questions, but I also want to get to all the cases and uh, make sure. So I think what we'll try to do is keep addressing the Q&A as we go, but also um, uh, continue continue things things on. So the next case discussion. Thank you, to Rishi, uh, Dr. Bisi. That was a, a great, uh, great case. Um, the next discussion will be uh, Dr. Billy Honga, who uh, practices at the Mukin Billy Orthopedic Institute in uh, Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. So I'll present the next case. So next slide, please.
so uh, this is the 52 years now who presented to me uh, a year after injury and the, he had chief complaint of pain or left knee was deformity after he was involved in motor traffic crash. He was treated at a small hospital, uh, non-operative with a cast, and he was referred to me for a possible total knee replacement. Next slide. So during the examination, I was able to find that he was ambulant with a limping gait. He was using a walking crutch on the opposite side. Had no surgical mark on his knee. The knee was in varus. And there was a motion on the knee, had good friction up to 90 degrees and it could extend to zero. Uh, he had stable collateral ligaments. Next slide. And he had anterior and posterior drawers test was difficult to examine because of deformity and maybe a long time of injury and the meniscus also were difficult to assess. Next slide. So further with radiological examination, try to do x-ray. Uh, maybe the panelists, could you help me with these x-rays? What, what do you see? I project the quality, but that's what we were able to get. Tom, any comments? Yeah, I, I mean, I think you can see a lot of important things, actually, Billy, with this. Um, uh, you know, one is that clearly there's a, a, a again, a large tibial condylar fragment. Um, I see a double density on the medial side, which makes me think that there is is probably a coronal split in that medial, on that medial side. And I also see that the fracture extends way over to the lateral side, right? So you can see, you can see, uh, you know, this, this fracture exits just within a few millimeters of the lateral cortex of the proximal tibia. So, uh, you know, it's a very, you know, there probably is some impaction there too. Again, there is a double density there. So there's, I, I, I'm seeing the likelihood of impaction. Um, as well as a, uh, a, a medial condylar variant that, that travels all the way across. Um, really, this is very much a bicondylar you know, uh, variant of fracture. And finally, I see um, some, you know, some prominence uh, around the area of the, uh, the tibial eminence, um, which for me suggests that there's likely also associated avulsion fractures of one or both cruciate ligaments. So maybe when we are thinking about treatment, should we give up or see what the participant is thinking about how to treat this type of? Yes, great. Injury. We're going to launch a poll here just to see what. So this looks like essentially this is just to summarize. This is a, a year old um, tibial plateau fracture with a malunited sort of posterior medial fracture, but that extends across into the lateral part of the joint. So, Dev, any uh, other comment when it comes to investigation, what would you want to do more? Is it enough with these plain x-rays or do you want to do some other investigation? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, for me, I would really want a CT scan. Uh, I think this is a, you know, somewhat of a complex pattern as, as Sam alluded to, there are areas that may have depression. Um, it's not necessarily just one one simple simple fragment, and I don't know exactly what its orientation is in three dimensions. So for me, I think it would be really helpful um, to get a CT scan. I'm also wondering, it's, it's a little hard to tell, you know, how much arthrosis there is in the knee joint at this point. I think the CT scan sometimes can be helpful for that as well, because um, that's gonna help with kind of this, this decision about, uh, about definitive treatment. Um, but certainly if yes. we're considering an osteotomy or something, we, we would want to make sure that the joint's not, the arthritis isn't, the knee's not too far gone already and that there is, and we want to understand really the plan of fracture to really differentiate intra-articular, extra-articular osteotomy, I think. Sam, do you have any? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really, so a couple of observations. One is that that medial, that poster medial fragment it, it is often, it, you know, it is often non-united. So we may think that it's united there. A CT scan is extremely helpful in actually figuring out whether you actually have a malunion or a non-union. 
Um, and then, as Dave alluded to, the, the, the zone of impaction is really an important determinant for me as to whether I think an intraarticular osteotomy um, alone is going to be helpful. Because I find that when you've got, you know, when you've got clean breaks into the joint, those are easy enough to, to recreate um, or free up and reduce. But when you've got an, a, an extensive zone of impaction, that's a very tricky thing, you know, in a late, and you've got, you got, yeah, Billy and Rishi, you guys have much more experience with those late presentations that we do, but it's just not that satisfying because the whole thing is kind of smushed down. It's like a, you know, like a rotten tomato or something. And it's just, it, it's very hard to get that and reform a more native looking anatomic condyle. And sometimes at that point, I, I say, you know what, the articular surface is not great, but is, if I can realign the limb, I think I'm more likely to be able to get more mileage out of that joint and, and improve its longevity. Yeah, so here we have the result of the pool. Um, it shows majority of uh, thinking of uh, arthropus as patient was referred to me, but uh, I had an idea that he's only 52 and giving him arthropus could be uh, limiting his activities. And I thought like, I'm seeing a joint line on the medial side, which may be if I, I realign this limb will be still functioning. and he might need arthropus later on in his life. So uh, as we said, I had thought that that was a uh, Shaskafo, which is my United and the option was like, okay, I want to go do collective osteotomy, which is an interarticular one, and apply to push this fragment in position, at least they align the knee for getting a union and later on think about arthropus. So I don't know, what, what do you think Dev, with that? Yeah, I mean, uh, um... It's, you know, we have one AP view, uh, so it's hard to say, you know, to really completely assess, but I think that definitely what you can see is the limb, certainly the overall alignment uh, looks improved. It's hard to, hard to say, um, there's still a little bit of a double density on the medial side. I, I wonder, could you share a little bit about how, what you did to kind of get that, elevate that fragment? So I went, I did um, a postural medial incision to find out where the apex possibly could have been. And then with the help of uh, uh, Floro, I pushed a K-wire to come all the way to the, a major gap, which is on the, a bit lateral. So through that, I, I pushed my osteotomy to the medial and I, I had a, a, a stem and pin on the, proximal of this fragment, which helped me to push that fragment up. And then I created a gap here, which at a certain point required me to fill it. So I had to take a bone graft and fill that, that gap. So to avoid that, it doesn't collapse again. So after that, I applied my plate. That's great. Um, I think Again, just for the sake of time, we have another kind of similar case that's on a similar theme. So we're gonna hold on the Q&A and go through the next case, and then we'll have more time to discuss kind of this, this issue. So um, the next one will be by Sam Morshed. Yeah, so uh, um, uh, continuing on this theme of the medial side, it's not like we've forgotten the lateral plateau, by the way. The lateral, you know, Schatzker two variants are far and away the most common plateau fractures you're gonna see here. And you get a little bit of the flavor of that in a case that, that Dr. Shear is gonna present in a, in a, in a little bit. Um, but, uh, you know, it, so can we see the next slide? Um, this was a, a, a construction worker who came to see me, um, you know, similar to Billy's patient, one year out from injury. Now this, this, this problem, is almost worse in my opinion than, than what, what Billy ended up getting, right? So he's one year out from surgery and he comes in and says, I haven't been able to work. Um, I've been on pain medicine. My knee doesn't feel stable, but it also feels stiff. Um, and I just can't get back to work. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, I, I ask you to really, you know, scrutinize these x-rays now in light of what you've seen and, uh, and, 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 and tell me, you know, tell me what, 
you know, to think, you know, think about what, you know, what did happen here? I'll, I'll just throw it to Rishi. What do you think of these x-rays? How did they, how did his, how does it, how did his initial surgery go? Uh, well, we can see that uh, there's a lateral tibial plateau fracture as well. I don't think that was addressed in, initially, as you can make out. Um, and there is um, some amount of knee subluxation as well. So, well, the subluxation wasn't addressed at the beginning. And then the medial plateau, I mean, the lateral, the medial side wasn't addressed at the beginning. So these are the two things which I can see right now. Yeah. Yeah, so great observations. I think we have some more imaging on the next uh, on the next slide here, um, and uh, you can see very clearly here what the major problem is. I agree, Rishi. I think this was a bicondylar variant that the patient's initial surgeon only really saw the lateral side, and what we you know what we've seen here, and there are actually many studies that are now actually decades old. Um, which have shown how many of the plates, uh, many of the locking plates that are used, I don't know how many of you have access to locking plates, but many of them fail to really target or capture this poster medial fragment. And of course, a plate is not going to reduce a displaced poster medial fragment, right? So this is a, you know, this is a real, you know, this is a real issue, um, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of, you uh, uh, addressing these kinds of fractures. So, yeah, I love I love the answers that are coming in with the the, the question uh, that we've posed to you all, and you know I think we'll you know we'll agree that you know this was probably and most of you are seeing this a combination of a lot of these issues, right? Uh, you know, failure to reduce this fragment, um, uh, inadequate fixation, and uh, probably an incorrect approach. This patient probably needed the, the medial approach every bit as much as they needed the anterolateral approach. Yeah. So thanks. Now let's you know let's let's think for a moment here. Um, uh, you know, I want you to just kind of imagine in your mind's eye. I'm not going to launch another poll question, but you know, I'll put this to the to the panel here. Um, at this stage, uh, Billy, you're the pro at fixing these delayed medial frag fractures and, and missed medial condylar fragments. What, what would you do with this patient? How would you, how would you approach this? Yeah, I think because we have all the luxury of having a CT scan, which might be difficult for us to identify. If you look on a, on a pre-X-ray, that fragment doesn't look to be that big. It, it, it looks like a very small one, but here on the CT scan, that fragment is very big and grossly displaced. I think by seeing this, for sure we need, and, and it looks like there's no union here, but it will be very difficult to mobilize it up unless union open, release it nicely so that it is free to move. And maybe if you have distractor, distract this tibia and give some interarticular space, then push this fragment back and put a postural medial plate. That, that would be my, my approach to this patient. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that's a great plan. I think this, this, this CT scan says so much about this problem, right? That the, you know, it was said earlier that the, that the femur tends to follow the medial tibial condyle and more specifically the posterior medial aspect of the medial tibial condyle. Um, you just, and so th this subluxation is going to wreck this poor young man's knee um, in very, you know, very short order. So let's move on. I'm going to just show you a few uh, images um, from the, uh, from the, from the surgery. Uh, so just, you know, just kind of keep this in your mind as we flip through the next few slides, just in the interest of time, I'm going to move along and just show you what we did. I followed uh, Dr. Aonga's uh, instructions. And uh, I think it got us to a good place. Let's see the next uh, next question or next uh, slide. Um, okay, we thought a little bit about these questions as well. Let's move on to the next slide. So here you can see that you know even though this is kind of a non-union, so I've put this patient. Um, I've actually put this patient prone. I did this case in a prone position because I really thought it would be easier for me to get all the way around. But it's a it's a prone posterior medial approach. Um, one of the questions, at least a few of you have asked how I would position these patients. When I'm doing combination 
anterolateral, posterior medial, put the patient supine without a big bump under that ipsilateral side. When I'm focused on this area, I'm going prone. Um, and you can see this is an osteotome that's re, you know, that's just freeing up or recreating that fracture line. An intraarticular osteotomy would be a very similar approach with a curved Lambot osteotome. Um, next slide, please. Here you can see, uh, again, I've listened to Dr. Aunga and I, I've, I've used my universal distractor. I do not do tibial plateau surgery without a universal distractor. It's there every single time. It is a patient, powerful, humble assistant, right? Better than any resident. Um, and uh, it, 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 serves, it serves my aims here of really restoring and pulling, you know, creating this tension vector on the medial side to get the femur out of my way so I can put the tibia back to where it needs to be. Provisional fixation here and then application, next slide please, of a, uh, of a buttress plate um, by way of this posterior medial approach. And this is, you know, th this is the final construct. This is all it needs. It just, it needs to go home, right? So we've, we've placed this plate in a buttress mode. It's not a fancy locked plate. Any of you uh, have access to a plate that you can use to achieve this function. Um, and uh, and that, was, uh, that was it. And uh, next slide, please. You'll see some, uh, some post-operative imaging here. Um, this patient, uh, two years later, is doing a lot better. His knee, you can see the improvement in the sagittal plane. I saw a lot of great questions about sagittal plane alignment. People were asking about this case and prior cases. So we're really thinking about, you know, how does the posterior tilt look? Have we restored it more or less? Um, is the knee still subluxated? No. Um, the guy's still, you know, unable to work construction, but he's gotten back into some light desk desk work um, and uh, uh, a reasonable, I think, save of this knee, which would have otherwise gone on to osteoarthritis very, very quickly. Any comments, uh, Rishi or, or Billy? I know we've got a lot of active discussion now and folks raising their hands, but any of our panelists have, uh, have tips or pointers? Is there something else I should have done? Well, somehow the subluxation somehow the subluxation seems to be corrected. Yeah, yeah it's amazing. When you put that posterior medial fragment back, it, it kind of works. It's amazing. Femur follows the tibia. So if you get the tibia right, <clears throat> medial tibia. Yeah, some, it, it seems like at the tibia spine, there's uh, this fragment, which looks like a vast. Did you assess the yeah, thank you for asking that, Billy. A lot of great questions about, you know, what you do with those avulsed fragments early on. So I, I think that, um, and I, I showed a couple of cases in my talk where I actually went and I, I chased larger avulsed fragments. If it's big enough for me to fix, I'll often fix it. Um, but, you know, the rule tends to be in these kinds of cases that patients are stiff not unstable, you know, so long as you've got the bony architecture restored, which we did in this case. So I'll usually in this kind of delayed phase, I will do the repair of the bony anatomy and I'll check for instability. If the patient still has ligamentous instability and ACL that's out and the knee is grossly unstable, at this point, I don't think any sort of repair is going to work. This patient is looking at a reconstruction. So I'll work on getting the bones to heal right, and then I will, uh, I'll, I'll reconstruct the, uh, the, cruciate, uh, the cruciate ligaments if need be. I just maybe one last question because it was relevant to both cases, but when, when would you consider, obviously this is a pretty clear cut case, I think for intraarticular osteotomy, just because it's such a pure split, but um, when would you think about an extra, extra articular osteotomy? Yeah, I, you know, I, I think it's a good question. And I, I think again, extra articular, if the zone of impaction is really broad, there's not a clean zone that I can recreate, restore that fragment and fix it. Um, it's just this mush of impaction zone. In that case, what I'm thinking, and, and, and Billy alluded to this, was just, you know, restore, you know, coronal plane alignment, all right? And sagittal, if you can get it there, you know, with an, with an extra articular osteotomy. 
so long as there's not such gross, crazy step offs that I think it's just going to have it, immense contact pressure on, you know, on a single point like you saw in this patient's preoperative CT scan. I think an extra articular osteotomy is a really, you know, a really good idea. I think you can get into a really messy situation if you're, you know, you're stuck trying to reduce, you know, just really poor soft bone quality, uh, you know, over a, a broader surface area of the joint. Right. And it seems like if it's more of a, more of an alignment issue and less of an intraarticular, you know, clean intraarticular step off, that's going to favor the extra articular osteotomy as well. Okay. Um, let's see. I think what we should do just for timing, we'll do the last case and then we'll just use the rest of the time uh, to focus on, on Q and A. Um, so I'm going to present the last one. Uh, this one's going to be a little more straightforward, just a uh, 36 year old woman who was in a, a crash her a motor scooter. She's a, otherwise uh, very healthy. Uh, she, you know, lucky enough, she presented early. Uh, all those issues that we talked about in Rishi's case in terms of uh, being open or compartments or uh, vasculars, none of those were a concern. Her ABIs were, uh, were normal. So we're basically just dealing with this um, uh, uh, bicondylar type pattern. Um, I think, again, for the sake of time, we talked about staging, and I think most of us agreed. I'll tell you that she is quite swollen, and I felt didn't feel comfortable with um, doing the definitive treatment early. So this patient did go ahead and get external fixation. So can you just go to the next slide, please? I'm not going to, you know, belabor the point, but I just think compared after seeing these last two cases, I think this just kind of illustrates what the benefits of an X fix are for these, you know, plateaus that in, fractures involve the medial plateau and are length unstable. So, you know, the X fix can reduce that subluxation and just through ligament ataxis can largely uh, uh, help reduce that posterior medial fragment. And this just buys us time because now that you have this X fix on, now if the patient needs to wait two, three weeks or even longer, um, your, your surgery when you come back is gonna be much, much simpler than the, the cases that, uh, that Dr. Honga or uh, uh, Dr. Morshed just showed you. Um, next slide. So here we are in the, in the external fixator. Um, and I just want to actually maybe, so here's the external fixation alignment. Again, we see that the medial plateau is well aligned. We see that there's depression of the lateral plateau. Uh, um, and we did have some comments about when to do the CT scan. So in this case, we got the CT scan after the external fixator. So if we can go next slide. Here's our axial images. And maybe now I'll just get start getting some thoughts from the panel a little bit on what they're seeing on the CT scan um, thus far. Um, Rishi, any, any comments thus far? Billy? Um, yeah, the looks of this fragment is not only posterior medial, but goes all the way posterior, touching the lateral, the, the, the lateral fragment. So, and I'm not seeing obvious depression. It looks like a split with comminution, and which is posterior medial all the way to the posterior part. Yeah, I think that. Um... What we're seeing on this axial view is it's giving us a pretty good assessment of this medial fragment, which is a little bit more the, similar to the other cases is a, is a fairly classic sort of uh, coronal posterior medial fragment. Again, thinking about Psalm's case, this is one where if you try to hit this with a lateral plate, you run the risk of not, your screws may end up just like the case that we saw with Psalm, you may not hit it. Um, so that's the, that's the first thing. So. Next slide, please. And now here we see the coronal imaging. Um, Billy, any additional thoughts looking at this image? It looks like you have a comminution and this fragment is teething on the other side.
Um, you know, it's kind of a nice, relatively one sort of one one big piece uh, on the lateral side. Um, Saw any other comments just on the imaging thus far? No, I think this is. I mean, I think this is really uh, this is really helpful. There have been a couple of questions that have come in about. 3D reformations of your CT scan. I don't find those particularly useful. I find these coronal and sagittal plane reformations really give me all the information that I need. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess if you can get the 3Ds, it is kind of nice um, as you're thinking about where you want to put your plate and orient it. But it's true. I think, you know, if you're if you get used to Basically, when you see these coronal and axial and sagittal scans, usually you're sort of recreating that 3D image in your head, and but that is something that takes a lot of practice. Um, so if you've been doing it as long as Dr. Morshed, then it's it's probably easier. But I think you know having the 3D just kind of does it does that for you. So if you have the ability to do it, um, certainly there's not not much downside. But I don't think it's necessary by any means. Um, so next slide, I think we're just going to ask a poll now of, um, we've got this patient spanned. Uh, we know they've got a bicondylar fracture. They've got, um, and the question is about uh, how you're going to approach the definitive fixation. So we've got a depressed lateral plateau, and we've got the coronal shear posterior medial fragment. So what are your thoughts, Rishi? How would you approach this fracture? Uh, well, again, I would start with, uh, we, I mean, I agree that uh, the posterior uh, medial fragment needs to be uh, addressed first, and then I would address the, uh, uh, the lateral one, the lateral tibial plateau. Uh, and as far as the question of depression goes, because um, I mean, the x-ray looks worse, but the CT scan doesn't look that, that bad. So I wouldn't really bother about the depression. I would just fix it with the posterior medial plate and then go fixing the lateral plateau, and that's it. Great. Billy, any other comments? Yeah, I think for the simplicity, I would do that, because I, I, whenever I look, when uh, Sam was demonstrating the posterior approach, I'm like scared, and which I think it will scare everybody in our operating room when they see you're putting a patient prone and you're going you know, right posterior and you want to address the whole fragment. So I think I would rather go for postural medial rather than, which I, I thought like maybe some should comment. I, I was watching his video uh, on surgical approach. Would you go with that all the way posterior to try address that one? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, the, the CT, the axial CT that they showed showed a pretty poster poster medial apex. Um, this is not one I would do prone. I, I, I put these patients, um, as I said, I put them supine without a bump. And I typically have a, uh, a spanning external fixator on them that I've initially, uh, I, I put at the, at the time of the initial spanning procedure. I typically, unless the pin sites are terrible, I tend to prep that into the field because I really like, I mean, I think Dave had a very nice indirect reduction achieved with his initial spanning external fixator. I don't want to forfeit that when I'm starting the surgery. So I keep that on and it becomes a nice big lever. So I can, you know, I can, I can actually, you know, I can actually turn that leg externally, rotate the hip by way of the external rotator and get way the heck around. So it is a, it's a true poster medial, just like showed in the, in the videos um, that I'm getting with the patient supine. And then when I'm ready to go over to the lateral side, you know, same thing. You can use that lever to, you know, internally rotate the hip and get, you know, get to the lateral side without much of a problem. Um, the, uh, you know, the, in addition to that, I'm typically, again, I told you I never do this case without a universal distractor. So the medial side usually doesn't re require that. Um, uh, in some cases, you may even have to take a little bit of tension off, you know, in order to, re you know, to relax the gastroc a little bit um, and, you know, get the, you know, get, uh, allow you to kind of bring that fragment up. And then I go to the lateral side and I do a standard submeniscal. And in addition to that, that X fix, which now also helps protect my medial column reduction. I will distract the lateral side in order to adequately visualize the articular surface and restore its anatomic relationship with the rest of the tibia. 
So, so first of all, the, to address the poll question, I think most people said uh, medial, sin, and lateral, and I, I, um, that's what was done here. I think that's the, the bread and butter approach by you first, basically, by restoring that medial column, you've essentially converted it from, you know, into a, a Schatz for two at that point, and then you can deal with the lateral side. So almost always start medially, uh, as was said. In terms of positioning, I think for me, when I'm going to be work, when I have work to do on both sides, uh, I generally prefer to keep them supine. Just like Sam said, I like to keep the X fix on because it's it's already got you a lot of the way there, and it can act a little bit like your distractor. Um, so that was done in this case. I just kept the X fix on. Um, it's a posterior medial approach, and you see the um, clamps applied to get that initial reduction. Um, you know, you can still kind of see the fracture line, but it's it's you know reasonably reduced at this point. Um, in terms of, you know, a lot of times your clamps are then blocking the, the plate, plate placement. So I often will put K wires in and then withdraw them out the other side. That's what we see on the far, on the far right image. And then that allows the, uh, a plate to be placed. Um, and again, this is, this is a, is a locking plate, but it really doesn't need to be, uh, any kind of fancy locking plate. It, this could be a, definitely be a non-locking plate and achieve the same, uh, buttressing function, but typically applying the plate and then putting in some screws just distal to the apex to really tuck in the apex of the fracture and then uh, and then and then filling the additional fixation. The key here, what's different than some of the other cases, because we're going to have to come and address the lateral side second, is we don't want to block our lateral fixation with our medial fixation. So you do have to be a little bit thoughtful uh, about your screw placements. Uh, a lot of times the distal screws can be bicortical, but the proximal screws are just unicortical to hold on to that fragment. So you can go to the next slide. So this is what it looks like after, you know, just fixing the medial side of the fracture. Again, note, note that these are just, usually they're like a, you know, a 26 or a 30 millimeter screw or something like that. So it doesn't, it's not going to get in the way of what I'm going to be doing on the, on the lateral side. And at this point now it's, it's just <laughs> fixing a, just like fixing any other other shots for two. Um, so I'm gonna apply a laterally based distractor, submeniscal arthrotomy. Um, and then there is, I think, we haven't talked at all about lateral tibial plateau fractures. So I think this is an opportunity to maybe just pull the audience a little bit about, you know, preferred ways of doing that. You know, there's sort of broadly two ways to deal with lateral plateau fractures, a containment technique where you keep the lateral you know, split intact and elevate uh, through a cortical window or an opening the book technique, so to speak, where you open up that split. Um, Billy, uh, any comments on your, you know, sort of a preferred approach for the lateral plateau or how you make that decision? Yeah, if um, I recognize that I don't have commission, I'll go for open book and try to see what is there. But when uh, I'm scared about losing some fragment, that's when I want to put a window and just elevate those fragments. Which are there. Yeah, it's very reasonable. Rishi, any comments on that? Well, in general, if, if, if I'm just fixing a lateral uh, tibial plateau, I would probably, I mean, my choice would be, preferred choice would be a percutaneous one, but this is a bicondylar. Um, I'll try to give a mi minimum incision and probably, you know, do some sort of meeple procedure, something like that, put a plate. What do you, so you would do like a, describe a little bit how you get, do this with a meepo technique. Uh, well, I'll, I'll give a very small uh, la anterior lateral incision uh, by which I'll just fix the uh, fracture uh, and then like slide the play, uh, plate all the way down and then, you know, this is just a straightforward common MIPO techniques to get the distal fixation right. Probably I would give like two centimeters of two, 2.5 centimeters of incision on the lateral side. Yeah, I guess I'm still like old school. I still just do, I do kind of this typical lazy S center lateral incision. Um, you know, do the peel off Gertie's tubercle, do a, apply the distractor and then uh, do a submenisk arthrotomy. I do like, uh, I'm a little biased towards doing the containment technique, I think more often than the opening the book, just because I feel like I don't like the, you have to cut through the capsule and sort of devascularize some of that stuff. I, I never feels right. Although I think there are definitely some times when opening the book is preferable. If you have, if the splits already wide open, just due to the injury, it's hard to say no to just continuing to open it. 
or if you have a case that's really old, um, you know, more than a few weeks old, I think sometimes it needs a little bit more mobilization. Sometimes that's easier with opening the book, but otherwise I generally go for the containment technique. So do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I share your bias um, against opening the book, uh, except when it's, you know, it's, there's no other way to do it, right? And as you mentioned, sometimes it's just, it's there at, you know, staring at you. I mean, the, 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 the injury of, is of sufficient, you know, magnitude that it's already open for you, in which case you, you know, you, you take what, you know, take what nature gives you. Um, yeah, I mean, I, and, and the submeniscal, I, I don't know, Rishi, if you're putting a, you're doing a submeniscal through that limited anterolateral, but I, I do think that, you know, seeing that articular surface is really important, um, commonly associated with, you know, a lateral meniscal tear, um, which you would never, you know, you'd never want to miss, you know, that, that's, that, that's such an easy fix. And as much as, you know, us trauma surgeons, um, minimize the importance of the work of our sports medicine colleagues, like really getting a lateral meniscus tear fixed is very important for buffering the long-term impact of this injury on that joint. So really, really, really important. Um, and it's staring right at you. As soon as you do the submeniscal and you've got adequate distraction on the lateral side, you'll see that it's typically a uh, a longitudinal red red zone tear that's very easily repairable with an outside in technique. All right, let's I, do agree next. With Sam. Um, I agree with Sam. Even even if I go for a MIPO approach, you know, I'd always want to go for a submeniscal thing and try to see the meniscus. Well, um, that's that's what I routinely do, and that that should be done. In fact, yeah. right. Um, next slide. So this is sort of just illustrating that containment technique. First, can't emphasize it enough is just notice, notice the distractor that's on there. So that's getting the femur out of the way so we have the space to elevate that <laughs> lateral joint line. Um, you can make a little cortical window somewhere in this area and insert the bone tamp in order to get that piece up. This is shown fluoroscopically, but you can actually, I don't actually use the fluoro during the elevation. I just look at it and feel it as I'm doing it and direct the bone tamp just uh, visually. Um, but I think this is nice just to illustrate what the bone tamp is doing. I usually feel the deep, it's kind of a whole nother discussion about what you do with the defect just because of time, I'm not going to go into it. I usually just, I usually do allograft. Um, there's some evidence that calcium phosphates have better, you know, more stability, but they're really expensive and kind of hard to handle. So I just don't think it's worth the fuss. Um, Next slide. Again, this is just showing the lateral view, just highlighting that how much depression there was. This was the lateral joint line clear down here on that lateral lateral image. And then now we've brought it up and now we can see it uh, has been uh, been completely elevated on the uh, on that on that lateral image there. And then uh, again, with the containment technique, we're not opening the book. So you can just put wires across from the lateral side. Next slide. And those wires I usually keep in place because, um, again, this is just a simple non-locking lateral plate. It's a sort of an L-shaped plate that's designed for this. So it's pre-contoured, but it's non-locking. Um, and uh, I keep the wires in place just to be, just to stay here as a nice, I guess it's the lateral joint line. They're just kind of a little closer to the joint than what you can usually get the plate to sit. And uh, uh, just helps avoid subsidence of that lateral plateau. Anybody have any comments on that? So Dave, I wanted to ask you, or even Sam, if you have an idea. Uh, in our place, we are still using those old L plate with only two holes up here, which they give you schools of six millimeters. And I'm seeing here, like you guys were using 3.5. Any evidence that uh, 3.5 is better than those big schools, which sometimes are used for neck or femur fixation? I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, as, as trauma surgery evolves, I think that what we're, you know, what we're moving away from is large, you know, larger plates, larger screws and shorter plates to longer plates and smaller screws, particularly in this case where, you know, they create a nice, you know, a little bit more of a flexible raft to support the articular surface. Now, if you only have one of those 
L plates that you're referring to, uh, Billy. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. That plate can still be applied nicely in buttress mode. They tend to also sit a little bit lower. So you can always add an additional smaller plate, maybe a one third tubular plate with 3.5 millimeter screws laid you know, perpendicular, right? Or underneath, underneath the articular surface. We call these rim plates. There's a, a couple of examples in my talk that you can review, but they kind of sit right underneath the joint. Um, and they that would kind of be doing what, you know, those K wires are doing. Somewhere between those K wires and the raft of screws from this plate, you could add that above your larger L plate that you've used in buttress mode. And through that, rat, that rim plate, you can apply lag screws or position screws, depending on whether your articular fracture can tolerate compression or not, but those tend to be very, very useful um, aids in fixation. And I too like what Dave has done here. I, uh, uh, often for fragments that are too small to take regular screw fixation, osteochondral uh, fragments, I'll, you know, I'll use, I'll turn these provisional K wires into definitive uh, uh, rafters of the articular surface. Thank you. Yeah, I would agree that you know, generally um, I use more three, five fixation for plateau fractures because these plates are being used in buttress mode. They're very biomechanically, they're biomechanically in a very favorable position. And so they don't actually need to be very big. Um, I think the only exception is if you're trying to fix a bicondylar fracture from one side, which we've kind of said is not a good idea most of the time because you can't reduce it and all for all those reasons. But if you have that rare case where you're trying to do it all from one side with, then you really have, then you have to start thinking about locking fixation. You have to start thinking about bigger plates. But I honestly think that's, that's a rare scenario. And for most of the time, if you're doing dual approaches and you're buttressing from both sides, you can do a little bit smaller fixation and, 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 and still have really good uh, stability at the end of the case. Let's go to the next slide. So these are the post-op x-rays. Um, there have been some questions about post-op protocols and range of motion, so I figured we could just use this case uh, as our final case to just wrap up on that. So, Billy, what's, or Rishi, I guess, what's your usual post-op protocol for tibial plateau fractures? Uh, if the fixation is very stable, then I'm probably going to keep him in a knee immobilizer for um, about 10 to 12 days till you get the sutures out. And in two weeks time, uh, when I get the sutures out, then I start knee range of motion uh, with, a knee, um, uh, with a hinge knee brace or something. Uh, as for the walking, I start to touch right from the next day, but I don't give my patient weight bearing. Uh, then at about like six to eight weeks, I go for a check x-rays. Um, if everything is stable enough, then I start my partial weight bearing, but full weight bearing, I always did. I mean, I, I always wait till like uh, 10 to 12 weeks. Great. Okay. Uh, Billy, any comments on so your protocol? It's pretty the same, but the difficult situation is patient compliance. We do explain to them, but what I realized, what determine a patient to follow is pain. Whenever some that don't have pain, they will come up loading very early. So we tend to follow the same protocol as Rich is saying. And the weight bearing is kind of subjective to our patient, they will come when they feel comfortable, they start putting weight. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I generally agree with that. I, I actually have gone away from any immobilization at all. Um, so I put them in a soft dressing coming out of the, if I feel, as long as I feel good about the fixation, um, you know, maybe there's some rare exceptions with a tubercle fracture or something unusual or a meniscus tear or something. But generally speaking, for the vast majority of cases, I do no brace, no immobilization, and just range of motion from day zero. There's just so many issues with stiffness, which we'll see in this case as it goes forward, um, that uh, I just think anything you put on them uh, increases the risk of those type of problems. And then, but as far as weight bearing, I'm, I'm very similar. I do, I do my protocol is eight weeks of non-weight bearing, and then I kind of gradually progress between eight and 12. I don't know, Sam, if you have... Yeah, I, I mean, I, I like Dave, I, I, will, I will not immobilize my patients, nor will I even brace them unless they've got gross after, you know, you've got a nice x-ray like you're looking at here uh, post-op and you're 
confident with your fixation, but you still have significant either coronal plane um, or sagittal plane instability due to soft tissue disruption. Those are the only cases that I might put in a hinge knee brace. Um, but generally, my patients are not braced. They get a soft dressing, and we start moving post-op day one. Um, and uh, for lateral plateau variants, um, typically I I will protect them, protect their weight bearing for six weeks, and then I let them weight bear is tolerated. Um, for bicondylar variants, um, it's a little bit more. You know, I mean, because you've seen such a diversity of cases, it it, it tends to be a little bit more diverse. But I, I will tell you, I think the pendulum is is swinging towards earlier, uh, earlier weight bearing as well. Um, I think that we as surgeons are very x-ray focused. And what happens is we focus on x-rays and we do not want to see any shifting or movement here. Our patients get weaker, their bone mineral density disappears. Um, and those are changes that take you know years, if ever, to actually fully recover. So there are, you know, stay tuned. We're involved in some big studies now, randomized multi-center trials that are looking at earlier weight bearing protocols. Um, and I think that that's something that you can expect to see in the years to come. Awesome. So uh, generally consensus there, it sounds like an early motion, but delayed weight bearing, but maybe less delay in the future. So next, next slide. So this is just the continuation of this patient. So she came in to see me at about six weeks. Um, she's still having pain, still taking pain medicine, which I hate to see that. I, we have a lot of problem with that here in the US. And uh, we try, I try to get my patients off in the first week or two, but she's still taking pain medicine. She's not really moving her knee and her motion is 10 to, 10 to 40 at six weeks. So any thoughts? Uh, we can launch a, a poll about what people would do next now. And maybe as that's going, we can ask the panelists what they're, how they would handle this situation. Rishi, any comments? Uh, I would, I would, as, uh, as this, this, it, as it happens in this part of the world, you know, we advise the patient to go for physio, 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 aggressive physio. <laughs> that's what I would advise the patient. Yeah. Billy, any comments? Yes, I completely agree with physio, but uh, in our place here, we limit patient on analgesia, especially on non-steroid anti-inflammatory. They'll get some opioids injectable three, uh, 24 hours. And then if they will continue having any non-steroid anti-inflammatory is only three days and we advise them to be off on a medication. We don't know when they're home, whether they self-prescribe, but nothing is prescribed from the hospital uh, after three days. I don't know if we are too harsh on our patient, but that's how we follow. You know, I wish we could do that in the United States. The expectations around pain control are just, <laughs> it's a real challenge. I, I think Tanzanians and probably Nepalese patients are a, a heck of a lot uh, tougher than our patients. Three days. <laughs> I mean, I can't imagine that three days like stopping in anti-inflammatory. So. They, would, they would sue you. Yeah, we'd, would be, sue we'd, be in, uh, we'd be in court or something. Um, so it's a real challenge for us that is definitely unique to our setting. But I don't think stiffness is unique to our setting. So. Um, uh, Saw any comments on on what your kind of do you have an algorithm for dealing with stiffness? Yeah, I mean, I think it, at this stage, at six weeks, um, it, I you know I, I'm definitely uh, I'm definitely going to start recommending that the patient uh, you know go. This is a point where I'd probably recommend the manipulation under anesthesia if they're this limited six weeks out. Um, if they're really resistant to going back under anesthesia, I may give them, you know, I may, I, I may give them a good stern warning, send them back to their physio and see them within a couple of weeks. But I like to, I think that within three months, you've got a, you, you've got a window within which a good manipulation under anesthesia can be very effective in restoring range of motion. I think that after three or four months, things are starting to set in. It's like concrete that sets up. At, at that point, I think it's very difficult to, 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 to succeed with a manipulation alone. And I think a manipulation is so much less invasive than some of these other, you know, other options that you've got um, uh, listed in this poll. 
So I'm going to try to take advantage of that window and get them manipulated early. Yeah, I, I um, you know, the, the most common answer was aggressive physiotherapy and, and we try aggressive physiotherapy and she started therapy at two weeks and this is where she was. Um, so, you know, for me, if they're at, if they're close to getting close to 90 degrees by six weeks, that's usually kind of my, my ideal. If they're at 90 degrees at six weeks, I don't, I'm not worried at all and they can just continue with therapy. But if they're much, much lower than that, uh, then I, I feel compelled to, to intervene um, just to kind of help things along. Cause I fear that if they end up at three or four months and they're still at this range of motion, then my only, I'm no longer gonna have the option of a manipulation. I'm, I'm gonna be looking at these more invasive things like an opener arthroscopic lysis of adhesions. A quadriceps plasty is an incredibly invasive procedure that, you know, really that would be for the really late presenting severe stiffness type of case. So I'm really, my goal is to avoid that stuff. I tell the patients that's what they're going to get if they don't start working harder <laughs> with therapy. Um, but uh, the MUA, I think, uh, is useful for these this really severe early stiffness. So can next slide. Um, so this is what it looks like. She got her manipulation um, without too much force. That's the nice thing about doing it. It's kind of a, a little bit of a delicate balance because you're stressing your fixation. But uh, usually when you do it early, it doesn't take quite as much force. So I think it's reasonable to do anytime between six weeks and three months. Um, and uh, gives a big, a big boost to the motion. I think taking pictures and showing your patients now is really important as well. I mean, it's a, it's a small point, but I, I, in my experience, them seeing that x-ray that you have on the right there convinces them that they can do it. Right. Yeah. Uh, I always really take important. a photo and show them yeah. for sure. Cause they, cause they think that you did, you know, it's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with the bones that's keeping their knee from bending. Um, so I think it's important for them to see that it's possible. Um, absolutely. And this is the, this is here about a year and a half later. Um, she ended up getting, she still struggled with motion for quite a long time. Um, but eventually got to about 120 degrees, which is not a, I wouldn't consider a, a great outcome by any means. Uh, but I think she would have been headed for worse uh, without the manipulation, probably. Dave, can I ask you a question? Um, what was her ligament exam? She looks like she's hyperextending a little bit here. You can definitely see that there was an avulsion um, uh, of the, you know, of the eminence. What, what's your approach to that? Was this just not a big deal because she was fairly stiff? Or yeah, yeah. it's a great. Yeah, I think same, you know, discussion we had on Rishi's case a little bit as well. Um, she was ligamentously, her, her complaints were all around stiffness, not around instability. Um, I think to try to go in on her and do a ligament reconstruction, she would have never moved her knee again. <laughs> um, so I think it's hard. I mean, these patients are hard to do because ligament reconstructions create stiffness too. And um, anyway, bottom line is she wasn't, that really wasn't the complaint for her. And she did do really well with extension, but flexion was the was really the, the bigger challenge for her. So we've run over time a bit, but I um, there are a lot of really great um, Q and A questions here. Um, let's see. Is it possible to do a manipulation under intraarticular? Oh, hey, what does that mean? Intraarticular. Oh, local anesthesia, probably. Hmm. That's an interesting idea. Um, I have, I do, I don't personally have experience with um, with doing it with just local anesthetic. Billy or Rishi, any experience with that, or have you have a typical anesthetic way of doing it with when you do a manipulation? Um, no, not with the knees. Well, there's, uh, there's there, there used to be one of my friends who used to do manipulation for frozen shoulders with a local anesthesia, but for knees, no, I don't know. I don't have any experience with that. No, really. Yeah, our typical protocol is to do, um, our anesthesiologists do, anesthesiologists do a regional uh, nerve block or even nerve catheter that uh, makes the, so we do do, um, use local anesthesia, but it's more as a regional block. And then um, if with the uh, catheter, we can actually keep the leg numb after surgery. 
um, and have them continue to work on range of motion exercises after the, or I should say after the manipulation as well. But I don't have experience with using the, just intraarticular injection alone. But it's a, it's a good idea. It would be an interesting thing to study. I think that um, just in the sake of time, because we run over a bit, we're going to um, wrap things uh, wrap things up. But uh, I just want to thank everyone for tuning in. We're going to um, finish with just a, 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 some closing remarks from uh, IGOT's founder, uh, Dr. Rick Coughlin. Well, congratulations, uh, definitely, to the panelists, uh, Dave, uh, Cher, Sam, uh, Billy, and uh, Rishi. Uh, this format, I think, is uh, really quite exceptional, and I would love to hear the feedback from our uh, participants who've been uh, listening. Um, the format of, of using the slow-paced didactics uh, being available pre-webinar uh, to be able to review the basic principles, to look at the videos, and, and to be, uh, have the learner be pre prepared for this type of uh, webinar to maximize uh, these cases, I think is a, a better adult educational uh, format. So I'd love to hear uh, what everyone has to say. Again, I'd like to thank everyone. Uh, really uh, informative, uh, outstanding webinar this morning. Uh, let us know, uh, please give us lots of feedback. Uh, we're here uh, for our participants. So uh, thanks again to, uh, for today and we uh, will see you in a few months. Bye-bye now.